Hello, my name is Lee Bartlett and I'm the Psi Beta president. And tonight I have the honor of introducing our speaker. Elaine poker Yant has been a certified dementia practitioner, trainer, and teacher for over 20 years. Her work focuses on empowering individuals and their family to make their situation the best that they can by providing resource sources, programs she developed. <clears throat> she provides education about often unknown resources available in the community and teaches practical aging, life, and caregiving skills, including classes to help others better understand dementia. She authors a monthly column for the Arizona Republic and chairs a Sun Lakes nonprofit called Creative Engagement Partners that hosts the Southwest Valley Memory Cafe and serves as the Director of Dementia Care and Community Outreach for Visiting Angels East Mesa, or East Valley, I apologize. Elaine provides family coaching and aging conferences through her successful aging AZ LLC. Tonight she will be talking to us about the basic physiology of dementia in concepts that are easy to understand and will transform your connection and relationship with anyone living with these brain changes. Not only will you walk away with a better grasp of this disease, you will also understand options and choices you can make for a more successful and positive interaction with those living with dementia. And without further ado, Elaine poker Yant. Thank you. Thank you, Lee. Yes. Thank you for allowing me this opportunity to talk to you tonight. Um, I always like to have a good idea of who's in my audience. So the people who are not students, please raise your hands. OK, we got a few. Is there anybody here that does not have somebody in their family that lives with dementia of some variety? Hold on, keep your hands up because I'm looking around. So maybe about a third, all right? So typically, um, I've been doing the speaking gigs on dementia for probably about 10 years like this. And in that time, out of maybe close to 12 or 15,000 people, I'm still under 1,000 people that don't know somebody that has dementia. So that just gives you a great idea as to the spread of what's happening here. So tonight we're going to take a look at what's happening in the brain. And um, that's, we're going to show you some really great pictures, some really great visuals, some really great examples. And this is interactive. So when I talk to you, it's going to be just like in the classroom, because they're calling this a class or a lecture. Um, I, want, I want you to um, interact with me. I want you to share, because everybody will learn so much more, and so will you, to be able to be comfortable. So without further ado, Let's get rolling here. So maybe we need to, it was on. Let's try again. OK. So more than anything else, I want to focus on getting your expectations in check. So if you're a student, you may be a clinician at some point, whether you're here for nursing or social work or what have you. Um, something brought you today. So I want to be able to kind of, um, round this out so that everybody walks out with something that's very pertinent to them. Everybody um, has a, this idea about dementia. And so there's a, a global movement uh, to make it more accessible, uh, not to have the same kind of um, stigma. Because if you, anybody who's young here won't know, but back in the day, even when I was young, nobody said the word cancer out loud. It was whispered. And dementia is a word that is still whispered. So right now there is a global movement to kind of open the, um, open the doors, get education rolling, get rid of the stigma, and, and kind of bring it out from underneath, you know, under the clouds. So is that fish ever going to get into that fishbowl? What do you think? Maybe. Why do you think maybe? Kind of look at its trajectory. You think it might? You think, anybody else think it will? You do. Good for you. If, if you take the ruler and you kind of take where his nose goes, the fish isn't going to go in there because it's just a little bit too high. But we always have hope. And I love the persons that said maybe. And I love the persons that said hope because with dementia, 
there is hope. We can learn about it. We can learn how to deal with it differently. Um, we can love people. We can care for them with grace, with joy. But the thing that makes somebody get better about dealing with somebody with dementia is nothing other than practice. Okay, doing it over and over again. So when you see that somebody is trying, it makes all the difference. And I want to get your expectations in sync today because for those of you who do know somebody with dementia, if you know them especially in the early stages, people with early stage dementia are perfectly fine, except when they're not. They function in so many different ways very consistently until it stops. And there might be one bad thing a day or one rough moment a day. There might be several rough moments a day. You don't know because every day is different. And they may do the same routine five days in a row. And on the sixth day, they just sit and they're not cooperating. But you know what? At that moment, they're not not cooperating. They just can't process what needs to happen. And so it's this roller coaster. And it's really frustrating because when they do it most of the time, our expectation is here. And then they come in here and we're mad, we're frustrated, we think they're doing it on purpose, we think they're trying to torture us. Family caregivers think that. I'm one of them. My mom has had dementia, my dad had dementia, my mom had Alzheimer's, my dad had vascular dementia. My husband's parents have dementia. My mother-in-law doesn't quite know that she does at this point, and she's not sure she wants to know. So when you've got somebody who is in denial, so we'll talk about that in a little bit, or doesn't know, doesn't recognize, and you, um, it's very difficult for the family members. When you have somebody that's very aware of the changes, it's very difficult for the person with dementia but it makes it a whole lot easier on the caregiver because you can have interaction, you can have conversation, right? So I just kind of want to get your expectations set because sometimes seeing the pictures and hearing the words go with the pictures and the functions of the body that go with the changes of the brain, it just makes it a little bit easier for you to understand. And for me, it's all about getting people to understand so that we can do better because when we know better, what do we do? We do better. Maya Angelou says it best. So I want everybody to close your eyes, and I'd like to say I can see you all, um, but you know, with the lights you can't always. And um, when I ask you to open your eyes, I want you to register what you see first. Okay? Eyes closed. What do you, open your eyes. Look at the board. How many people see four? How many people see three? Who's wrong? No one. Why is nobody wrong? Different perspectives. Absolutely. So who in here has heard a story from somebody or is having a conversation with somebody and they're telling you something and you're trying to correct them? Anybody? Happen, happen to anybody? Yeah. So at the point that you're trying to correct them, you're trying to bring them to your reality. But they're over here in their reality. Because their brain is showing them a picture. Their brain is telling them a story. And we like to be right as humans. It's just human nature. We want to correct it. We want to make it right. We, want, we don't want them to look dumb. We don't want them to sound stupid. We want to help them. But we're not helping them at that particular point in time because their brain's telling them a story and it's showing them a picture. Does that make sense? And this is one of the things that I, if you don't take anything else away from today, you can walk out with this alone and that will just help you tremendously if you can remember it and if you can practice it. So the me the me uh, I've gone to, I can't tell you how many seminars and how many trainings and all different kinds of things um, to learn and, and I practice um, at Visiting Angels. I'm the director of dementia care, but I have been a care manager with them for 11 years. And prior to that, I worked at a company um, that I worked with seniors, like 4,500 of them. And I watched about mm, 300 of them age over an 18-year time span. So I didn't know until I was out of that position that I actually was like in a laboratory. And I was able to see all the changes, and I saw the things 
that they did well, and I saw the things that they didn't do well, and the things that frustrated them, and the things that were consistent, and the things that were variable. So Tipa Snow is that, um, in the beginning, it showed this um, positive approach to care. She is a, a global guru, and you can look her up, and she has a million things on YouTube. And she is an um, occupational therapist, and so she started looking at what can we do um, looking at how people still have their capabilities instead of looking at what their disabilities are and, and sort of dismissing that they could do certain things. Let's look at what they're still good at and like work with them to be able to function within their capability level. So that's where um, tonight's material comes from, okay? So what do you think changes the most with dementia? Just blurt it out. Memory? Personality, thought processes, say it again, everyday activities, pardon me, food, mood, big one, mood, absolutely. Nobody's wrong. All of those things change and probably 200 things more. But what changes the most that we don't ever focus on is our relationship with the person who has dementia because it's not the same. You know, we may be friends, we may be mother-daughter, we may be grandmother, grandson. That relationship can be any kind of variation. But we don't think about our relationship changing and we have to learn to work within a different kind of relationship with them. And oftentimes, in the process of that, we start grieving the relationship that we have because we don't have it anymore. We can't talk to them the way we used to. We can't share memories the way we used to. Maybe we can't physically or emotionally um, function in the same way that we did before, so those things don't happen. So we have to change how we function. And why caregiving is so hard for anybody here that actually has it in their family and you deal with it on a consistent basis, but this goes for clinicians just as much. We are the ones that always have to change. Somebody with dementia is experiencing brain change. Their brain is dying. It is progressive. There is no cure. And inevitably, it's something that's fatal. And it, you know, there are some medications that can slow down symptoms, and they work for some people really, really well, and for other people, they, people, for other people, they don't. Um, but in that process, we get that sadness, and we have to really figure it out. And when we have to consistently think, how am I going to do this? How am I going to do it this time? Because this time it worked, and this three times it worked, but this time it didn't work. How come it didn't work this time? because their brain was in a different place. So we always have to be on, we always have to be ready, we always have to be adaptable, and that's extraordinarily exhausting. So quick reality check. Goes back to that expectation again, if you take that one thing away. When we have an expectation here and we have reality here, it's disappointment. But not only is it disappointment, it is frustration, it is anger, it is sadness, and there are so many emotions that are tied to this disease, and it's okay to feel all of them because they're real. And you can't just brush them aside. And a lot of times with caregiving, people believe that they are a caregiver, and it's not a big deal, but it's a whole big job. And if we look at it like it's a job and we treat it like it's a job, our expectations are more in sync with the amount of work that we need to do. If we just think it's something we can do on the side, we get really frustrated and sad and angry because it's getting in the way of what our normal agenda is. So, um, did you have a question? No, okay. So, mild cognitive impairment. Oftentimes you will hear this um, phrase as MCI. Um, in a clinical field, absolutely, but um, sometimes it is the beginning of dementia. And that is it just, it's, it's a very slow beginning. We've got some changes happening here. You see these things going on, but MCI does not have to be the beginning of dementia. And if anybody comes away with that diagnosis, this is where you now become to need an investigator to see what it is, because our memory and our behavior and our language and our motor skills can be definitely very severely affected by infection, urinary tract infections in people who are older, 
can be very dramatic and very quick. So 20 minutes from now, after having a lovely little lunch, as we're putting dessert on the table, somebody can begin hallucinating that I am a clown or that somebody is throwing tomatoes at the window. It can be really dramatic just while sitting there because it was at that moment that the toxins built up to a point of unacceptab unacceptableness to the body. Um, dehydration in our lovely little heated state of Arizona can also make hallucinations and anxiety. Change in medication. You know, medication takes about three to four weeks to kick into gear. So when somebody says anything different, anything going on, you don't think that you started a medication three or four weeks ago. And so maybe you don't take that into account or you don't share that with a doctor. Um, anybody who has blood sugar issues, diabetes, also something that can very dramatically change the way somebody behaves. They can become very wilted. They can become very delirious. They can faint. Um, so all these things can fall under mild cognitive impairment, impairment as well as it being some early stage dementia happening, okay? So people get dementia and Alzheimer's confused all the time. Nurses and doctors, too, that aren't um, in this field um, also can. So I just put it out there. Dementia, no different than cancer. It is a big umbrella. It's actually a set of symptoms and not a diagnosis. There's about 110 to 120 kinds, um, different kinds of dementia, but the four most popular are Alzheimer's, which is 60 to 80% of all dementias, okay? Back, and just even maybe six to eight years ago, nobody really got an Alzheimer's diagnosis because we, we didn't take scans until we had autopsies. But now there are PET scans and um, things that we can take to start showing um, the brain and how it's changing. Vascular dementia is heart-related. It's blood flow-related. Back in the old days, they would have called it hardening of the arteries. We don't have the flow going through our body in the exact same way. High blood pressure can be associated with strokes or mini-strokes. Sometimes you might see somebody um, show symptoms of a stroke where their face is drooping or they can't get the words out, they can't keep their arms balanced, and, you know, maybe 20 minutes later everything seems fine. Those little mini TIAs don't always show up on scans, but those part of vascular dementia. Dementia with Lewy bodies. So typical dementia is all plaques and tangles. Lewy bodies are very abnormal brain cells that really um, structurally change the way your brain um, the way your brain changes in a very different ways, it's very similar in some of its symptoms to Parkinson's. So yes, um, more rigidity, like the neuromuscular, and when we think Parkinson's, we think Muhammad Ali, we think Michael J. Fox, where you really have difficulty getting moving, and the rigidity to the way you walk. Um, but um, there's a lot of hallucinations that go with Lewy body dementia. Oftentimes, a lot of people, I've had a lot of clients who've seen little people, little green and orange people, um, you know, like heads on the wall talking to you, different things. We have clients who, I have one client who has a naked lady that lives on the edge of his couch, and he said, don't you be taking away my naked lady, I like her. And we're like, we're not going to take her away. But different kinds of things, it's, a very, it's very different than some of the... Um, hallucinations that you would see with Alzheimer's. And then frontotemporal, that's when, every, this is the, the part of our brain that does all the reasoning, all our judgment, how we know that our socks go on before our shoes. With this form of dementia, nobody has any idea that there's anything wrong with them. About um, more than 50% of people have no idea that there's any dementia going on. And so people will say, Ah, my grandmother's in denial, my dad's in denial. Your dad's in denial because there's a little part of his brain that actually is able to understand the changes that are going, happening to him. And if that little part of the brain is affected, there is no way that he can see or understand or she can see or understand that they have dementia. So when we talk about somebody not wanting to admit it, if they're not admitting it, more likely than not, it's because they don't see it, because they can't see it. Now, the flip side of that is we have a lot of family members that are in denial 
that don't, they just, oh, it's just this or, oh, it's just that, and we rationalize because we're really not ready to accept that that thing is happening. So some tidbits here. So these are the most common forms of symptoms. On your handout, those are here. I don't need to read through them. And also on your handout, I gave you the top 10 um, early signs and symptoms of Alzheimer's from the Alzheimer's Association. Everybody processes words a little differently, but these are things that you can always refer to to look at. When you're seeing somebody having changes, you can go through these lists and say, I'm seeing some of this, I'm seeing some of that. Because typically, for us on the outside, or us as humans, even when we do these, you know, maybe show some symptoms ourselves or we start getting worried about things, you know, it happens and you kind of rationalize it. And you, you know, mom has been doing this and this and this. Oh, well, she's really tired. And oh, there's been a lot of company. And oh, there's been a lot of change. We don't really admit. But when you start tracking change, when you, when you start seeing changes over and over again, you need to start tracking them. And you need to kind of start tra tracking how often they're happening. And if there's any, um, just like allergies, any coincidences, anything or any consistencies to when those changes are happening. Likely you're not going to see consistencies, but sometimes when you have consistencies, it's not always dementia, so that's why I say that. So anyways, here's a little picture, and it just kind of gives you an idea, right? Here is um, our motor control. This is our thinking part of the brain. This is the part of the brain that rules us when we're not stressed. Temporal lobes are hearing, right? And um, parietal lobe perception, there's a stage of dementia where people are very sensitive to touch. We'll talk about that a little bit. Occipital lobe back here, right here's our cerebellum. Balance and coordination, this thins out as we age, which is why sometimes when we look up, we get a little bit dizzier, but that's why we don't like older people going on ladders because this is the part that makes them get a little dizzy and fall down, all right? Just, just a quick visual. So this cortex part of our brain, this thinking part, this is the part that rules us. This is the part that allows us to know left from right, right from wrong, um, delayed gratification, absolutely. Logic, we talked about arguing with somebody or trying to correct them. Um, one of the biggest things is seeing something from somebody else's perspective. And no matter, um, with Alzheimer's, that's one of the things that is a really easy sign to maybe start seeing. When we're having an argument with somebody who has always been really rational, who has always understood, has always been able to, you've been able to have discussion with them, but now you can't have that discussion and you're trying to convince them of something that they can't see, again, because I shared earlier that their brain is telling them a story and their brain is showing them a picture. Does that make sense? All right, limbic system. This is the engine of our body, okay? It's all part of our autonomic nervous system, things that we don't think about. Blinking, swallowing, scratching an itch, the engine in our body. Do you know, do you know how many steps there are to brushing your teeth? Throw something out there. Just number, how many steps do you think? 10? It's upwards of 35. Because we have to get to the bathroom, we have to know where the bathroom is, we have to know that we go to the sink, we have to unsnap and put down and um, put toothpaste on the tube and know that one's in the medicine cabinet and one's in the drawer. Does anybody ever even think of any of that? You can brush your teeth with your eyes closed in the dark over and over again without even thinking about the fact that your brain just went through like 35 steps. So this engine part is the part that does all these things we don't think about. The limbic system, it relates to our emotional memories and our feelings. So if you took your fingers, up, kind of put them in the middle of your head, do this. And if you kind of went all the way through, our hippocampus is right in the middle and that's that's our wayfinding, and that's another one of the areas that gets hit really quickly. So when you're seeing the silver alerts around, that's what you're, um, you've got somebody who got lost, they went out to go to the store, and all of a sudden they showed up in surprise, and they're like, hey, could you come get me? I'm not really sure how I got here. 
if we, so let's just say this was the first time you were in this auditorium, okay? If we blindfolded you, if you went to the bathroom and you came back, like let's say you went to the bathroom when you came in the auditorium and you came and sat down, we could blindfold you and you could tell somebody how to get you to the bathroom and back to your chair. You may not remember your seat number, the exact row, but you had that on your ticket, and you could do it because that's how our wayfinding system, once we see it, we know it, we learn it, it's a great thing, we can function. But if, but if our um, hippocampus gets affected, which it does early, that's when we start having problems with where we're gonna go. But it's an amazing thing, and just one time through a little series of getting somewhere allows us to be able to replicate that that's amazing. All right, our amygdala, that's what right, this goes to the put them up. We get scared and we're either gonna fight or we're gonna run. And so when people with dementia go into argument mode, they're deciding that they're gonna fight with you because they know they're right, because they're following that story and that picture that their brain is telling us. So when we're arguing with somebody, are we ever gonna win? No. So we have to just let that go. And that's one of the things that families get the most frustrated about. It's one of the things that even shows up in doctor's offices a lot when clinicians are talking to folks and asking them questions and the person with dementia is stating the facts and the spouse is going behind him. No, it's not like that. Because they're, they're telling their perception of what's going on and it's very different. Our amygdala will drive us to do anything. If it wants something, it is gonna fight for it and it's gonna focus on it and you're not gonna be able to get, that, get them to let up unless you really redirect them with something that's much better than what you're talking about right now. So redirection, um, redirection, just focus on something that they really love to do. Uh, that's, that's your best bet in that moment. So here's that learning and memory summer. Look at the difference here. I'm looking at my screen, but I need to be doing that. That's how uh -oh. Total healthy brain. Here's your, oopsie, sorry. There's your, um, right there, your Alzheimer's brain. Is that a huge difference? Okay, so grant you, this is a very advanced case right here. Oh wow, this is completely different than it was. This is better, huh? Um, sorry, it, I didn't. Anyways, so as that change starts getting smaller and smaller, those, um, your directions start getting worse, but even listening to directions or being able to follow somebody who's giving you multiple things to do in a row. So, look at memory loss here. So, now we've got healthy and we've got not healthy. Immediate recall, the things that we learn last are the things that we lose first. So everybody thinks about somebody with dementia talking about the old days. Think of an onion with layers and the core of the onion has stayed really long. We have all those memories for so many years. Every time we see a face, our brain takes a picture and it files that picture. So the people that have had the most pictures in our brain typically are the people that we know the most. That doesn't mean that we won't forget them, but it means they will still have more impressions in your head and there will be a comfort zone, especially if your relationship was comfortable. Because as people start to lose their skills and their language skills, what they will focus on is their reading nonverbal language. They will speak from emotion. They will speak from the heart. They will look at the, the way you are saying something versus what you are saying, okay? So, and the brain also loses relationships. So they may not know that you're a daughter anymore, but you, they know that you are somebody that will bring them comfort. You will bring them joy. You make them feel good. You make them feel safe. Uh, sometimes with grandkids, we don't see them in the same way that we maybe always do. But if you've got a relationship with your grandmother or your grandfather or whatever, and you do things together and you bond and they are happy memories, they are comforting memories, those are the things that they're going to feel when they see you, even if they don't necessarily remember your name or the fact that you are a grandchild. Does that make sense? 
The preserved abilities are those long ago memories, the emotional memories. Um, confabulation. So has anybody heard somebody tell a story and most of the story is real and then you get to another part of the story and it's wrong. So we're telling the story about a fish and that fish was 24 inches long. And you're saying, Dad, that fish was four inches long. But if, but in, in, so in the mind, let's use the story analogy with a ruler. And every part of the story is a different half inch or inch on the ruler. And we get all the way to inch seven and the story was perfect. But now we got to the size of the fish and where it was. And we were in Alaska and the fish was 48 inches long or three feet long or four feet long, whatever. And they're like, no, Dad, we were in Mississippi and it was like six inches. We had to throw it back. But again, the brain and the amygdala goes into protection mode when it's fighting for you. It wants to not make you look bad. So it goes and says, oh, you were on a trip. I'm going to pick out Mississippi. It says, oh, you were doing a fish. I'm going to find the big one. And it puts it together in that line so that when you tell that story, you're looking really good to all the people that are out there that are listening to your story. So your family knows that you're smart and you remember it and you can tell a story just like anybody else. It's not going to make you look bad. Your amygdala takes over and shines. So that's called confabulation. Again, very specific, specifically why the arguing isn't going to help. And we don't want to bring them back to what our reality is. We don't want to bring them back and say, this is right and you're wrong, because it's nothing but embarrassing. And we don't really want to embarrass somebody. We think we're helping them when we're trying to bring them back on track. And quite honestly, it wasn't until like 2007 until the Alzheimer's Association got on board and stopped bringing people back to reality. You know, somebody would say, I want to see my mother. And they'd say, your mother's been dead for 20 years. <gasps> How awful is that? We say, tell me about your mom. What did you like best about your mom? What's your best memory with your mom? Did she make your favorite foods? Start a conversation when somebody is talking about something that's in the past or something that's not you, or they're waiting for your sister. You know, we can't go until my sister gets here. Tell me about my sister. And if she really is going to wait till your sister is there, you may need to say, I think your sister is meeting us at the restaurant. Now, that could be construed as a lie, or it could be construed as something called a therapeutic fiblet. It's nothing that we always really like to do, but what we're trying to do with somebody living with dementia is ease them, calm them, make them feel better. And so when we're confronting them, it's not comfortable. What we want to do is we want to support them. The whole goal of um, living, living with somebody with dementia and caring for them and treating them, again, even as a clinician, is you want to be able to support what they're saying and make them feel validated because that's what's really important because then they feel whole, then they feel useful, then they feel like what they're doing is sound. And um, lies are meant to hurt people. Lies are meant to be deceptive. When we use that term, therapeutic fiblet, and we do it as little as possible. That's the goal always. But the idea is just to keep the situation calm and comfortable and having to somebody to feel safe. So what's the difference between a healthy brain and a non-healthy brain here? Alzheimer's and not. What do you see as a difference? Shrunk? What else? Not as connected, absolutely. What else? Coloration. It's very dramatically different. Now, again, this is pretty advanced stage, so it would make sense. But I sometimes, well, I don't sometimes. I always think that visual is so important because you will remember it um, so much better. So if you're looking at these pictures, so this is a picture from the top, if you were looking from the top on our head. And so, I can't do that up here. All the red and all the yellow, that is all the activity. Okay? So we start losing, I can't look up anymore. 
we start losing, start losing all the activity as we progress. Now, a lot of times people will use that phrase, my grandfather is acting like a child, I have to treat him like a child. And that even though we're seeing the activity in their brain being similar, the difference between a child and your grandfather is the fact that your grandfather has had this entirely rich life of people and places and experiences and accomplishments and relationships. And so they're not the same. They are so enriched from all of those activities and all of those memories and all of those accomplishments that we can't treat them like a child. We still have to have that respect. And usually when we're caring for people, um, usually when we're caring for people, what's the one thing that we're looking out for most before anything else? What do you think? Safety. Ding, ding, ding. Absolutely. So with safety, we need dignity more than anything. People need purpose every day of their lives to live, to be fulfilled, and dignity gives them that. And we rob them of that dignity when we think about them as five-year-olds or we talk about them in that way. I understand that sometimes some of their activities may be similar to that, but it's just a thing to really be careful of because it's, it's a respect issue, and we all want to do that. Okay, so our brain is changing in two ways. We talked about the brain changing, the brain is dying. So we have structural changes. And then we have chemical changes. So structurally, I want you to do this because this just helps you to remember. So put your hands together like this. And so this is that healthy brain, right? So now, kind of loosen your fingers here and there and kind of move them around. It's almost like electrical wiring. When they move, they can be connected at some point, but if you bump them, if you get in the way, if you bump them, it's, it's loose wiring, right? So no different than a cell phone when we're not connected really the same way, you know, um, with, with the best of Wi-Fi's, but, or, or like a lamp that has a loose wire and it's kind of flickering, or a fan is humming, something is loose. And so, Everybody, when they're having thought processes, when they're having conversations, when they're just functioning of daily life, sometimes it's loose. So maybe for the last three days, dad got up, he got dressed, brushed his teeth, came out to eat, and, and we had to go somewhere every single day this week. And he was ready at 10 o'clock every time like he was supposed to be. But on day five, he said, okay, dad, put on your shoes and brush your teeth, and we need to leave at 10. Okay, okay, okay. Then you come back. All right, I'll be here in 10 minutes, we're ready to go. In 10 minutes, we're ready to go. But he's not ready. Shoes aren't on, teeth aren't brushed. He took his pants off because it's not working at that time. That wiring is loose. He can't make the connections. And you're going to see soon how the words will fall into there too. Chemical changes, think about like high tide and low tide, right? High tide is when all the seashells and all the goodies come on the sand. Low tide, the, um, the water goes way out twice a day for each of those um, if we're at the ocean. Um, so we have good parts of our day and bad parts of our day. High tide typically for most people is morning. We've rested for the night and we do better in the morning. Some people sleep really late, so maybe their high tide is 11 o'clock. So if we're going to do doctor appointments, if we're going to... Um, go to outings, we're going to do things, we're going to socialize with people, we want to do it at the point in time where somebody is at their absolute best. If we know there's a time of the day when they wake up and they, some people wake up grumpy and not refreshed, right? So don't plan anything early. Don't set those appointments so that you're fighting the course of nature. Again, um, from a clinician standpoint, when we, let's say we're going to be working in... Um, let's say housing, um, senior housing, a memory care unit or assisted living, or even a doctor's office, if we know and families are trying to make appointments at particular times, we need to be careful of that. But in a place like a, um, like a memory care unit, when everybody has to do things rote and everybody's on a schedule and we're doing things like a, um, like a production line, not everybody functions in the same way and we have to learn who our people are so that we're not trying to get them to do things at times that they're not capable of absorbing what we need them to do. 
They're not capable to do it because they're not ready, not emotionally, not physically in their head, not, not there, not spiritually. They can't do it. So now this can shine when least expected. A lot of times caregivers and families think they're going crazy because they're telling their children, they're telling their families, you know, dad is doing this, dad is doing that, dad is doing this. And then family comes to town and they're like, dad's perfect. I don't know what you're talking about. Because when those kids came to town, dad's little amygdala said, I am not going to let you look bad. I will perform perfect perfectly. Now, that is not conscious. That is completely, again, the autonomic nervous system coming in to say, look, buddy, I'm going to take care of you. Meanwhile, mom's over here and everybody's calling her a drama queen because he thinks dad did everything right. How come he performs when they're here? Because she's his safe place. It's the place he can be comfortable. It's the place he can call home and he doesn't have to put on a show. He can be real. But I guarantee you when those children go home, that person, that man, that dad collapses. And now mom's dealing with a very tired man that's very difficult to deal with for a couple of days. So if this is in your world, and you've even heard maybe parents talking about it, or you get to a doctor's office and all of a sudden, you know, I, I mentioned that before, they're saying this is what's happening, and the spouse is in the background saying this is not how it is. So if you have, as a clinician specifically, I think that's my next slide actually, um, pay attention to what's going on when you see that so that you can take notes and you maybe as a medical assistant or you can share with the doctor as a nurse for things that's going on. Here's what I saw the wife doing in the background. We need to have a conversation to see what's going on. When I coach families about how to live with this a little bit better, I say when you're going to the doctor, write a note to the medical assistant and outline what's happening when they're, when they're home. This is what we're coming to talk about. This is what we're seeing. So when you ask him a question, know that this is, this is what we're dealing with, right? We have to kind of look for those, you know, read between the lines and look for those underlying cues because anybody who seems like they're doing really great and can have that conversation, but the rest of the information doesn't fit, you need to, you need to pay attention. All right, vision. So back here, this is our occipital lobe, all right? Now, we're pretty spread out, so this is a really great thing that you can do together. Put your arms out and separate if you need to. Just straight out from your shoulders and look straight ahead and wiggle your fingers. All right, raise your hands if you can see your fingers. Very few, okay. Healthy 20-year-old can see their fingers. Or sometimes, I mean, I can see them actually pretty, I don't know why, but I can, um, pretty well. Now, bring your arms in like this, okay? This is the field of vision of a healthy 75-year-old. Because as we get older, we start to process a little bit slower, okay? Just slows down. When else do we process slower? Tired sick, hangry, not doing well. What about stress? How well do we process when we're under stress? You have to just sometimes put up the hand and say, I can't take any more, right? So our brain says, oh, we're a little bit stressed. We can't take in as much data, and it changes our field of vision, okay? So healthy 75-year-old. Now somebody with dementia, we're processing even slower. And we take our data in visually. You'll see in a little minute. Um, we take our data in visually. So now bring your arms in about like this. And bring it up like a big scuba mask. How does your vision change with the big scuba mask? What's different? Focus. Can't see the sides at all. Yeah, it's very different. This is early stage dementia when our brain is at its stress point and the chemicals are not aligned and the wiring is not aligned. Our field of vision is very different. Now take this big scuba mask 
and make up binoculars. How different is that? If I were standing right in front of you with your binoculars, my body would be a bigger image than it would be with all this peripheral vision. And out here, this is like our spidey sense, right? Our safety zone. It's when we kind of sense that something's wrong. We see something out of the corner of our eye or we see something that's coming that's dangerous. And typically, um, from behind, if we're coming from behind, we usually put our hand on somebody's shoulder to let them know that we're coming around. But that startles them because they have no sense that we're coming. So if you've ever done that and you wonder why people you know, make that adjustment, it's, it's because we don't have that safety. Our curiosity is out here and our safety is out here. And so we lose our concept of safety first because as humans, when our brain's developing, and I know there's somebody here, um, the psychology department talks about the brain, like we lose that safety, that we learn that last. So it's one of the first things that we lose, that concept of safety. Curiosity here, safety out there. So kind of put that into perspective, if you are meeting with somebody for the first time and you want to greet them, you have to be in that little zone that they very comfortably see you, right? And then that's a, there's a whole class on that. Anyway, so how do we take in our data? This slide was supposed to be first, but we'll deal with it. Oops. Well, that was weird. All right, so data, data we see um, visual. 80% of the data that we take in, we take in visually. And so the brain is really smart. When we're taking in too much data, that's why the brain starts changing that field of vision. All right? Then we take in auditorily. So who's ever been told, uh, let's do this. Tell me something I can do up here. Um, I've got a clicker. I've got a water bottle. I've got hands and feet. Just say one thing that I can do comfortably. Grab the water bottle. Anybody can help her help me drink the water. Walk. Visualize the water bottle. Why do you think that I took that long to drink the water? Say it again. Remembering how to swallow? No. Say it again. Processing. Absolutely. I counted to 20. That was 20 seconds. So 20 seconds is still considered normal processing time. Now, we might be distracted, we might be stressed, we might be focused on something else, we might just have something else on our mind, or maybe I, I just didn't feel like doing that because I was just, you know, going to do something else. We don't, know, we don't know what that reasoning is, but that's still healthy brain processing time. And some of the faces that I was able to see were like, why isn't she doing it? Just do it. But then you, somebody said walk. Somebody said visualize it. But when we're a little bit stressed or we're a little bit preoccupied or we're not focused and people start like shouting out things to us. I've been in rooms where people have gotten like 20 different things, like spit it out, spit out 20 different ways to get me to walk over to that water bottle. What the one thing that would have done if I would have seen you that would have gotten me to do it a little bit sooner is if you would have taken a water bottle and said, take a drink because then you were mimicking, you were miming what I could do, and you were reinforcing it with nonverbal language. Because earlier, you remember, I talked about that when we start having issues with comprehension and with language, we go to nonverbal. No touching until we um, make a visual and we kind of greet somebody. We have to talk to somebody. We have to... Um, see somebody, we have to connect with somebody before we touch somebody. We touch the bodies of people who have dementia and we get into their personal bubbles in ways that we never would for somebody who has cancer, congestive heart failure, or anything else. 
because we believe that we are there to help them, but we don't give them a chance. We have to be let into their space by connecting with them, by making eye contact with them, by putting out a hand and letting them bring us into their space. Does that make sense? Because they may not process at the same speed that we do. And when we talk, sometimes we say too much and we're just overstimulating them and they don't know what to focus on. So we have to slow it down, we have to bring it back, we have to make sure that we're invited in in a comfortable way, making eye contact. Questions? Very quiet, okay. All right. So all skills, we, those, um, those latter skills, the smell and the taste, those are really good ways to um, connect with people in very late stage dementia. But focusing on the visual, focusing on keeping the verbal as minimal as possible when we need somebody to do something and when strength, um, when strength, when we need somebody to do something and um, th they're not processing in the same way. Okay. So language, now this is, so we, language is on the left side of our brain and we lose it. So if you look at, I'm not going to do that, big difference between that healthy and between that non-healthy. Hearing, it's like a chicken bone up there, it's not very different. So hearing, um, the ability to hear well is not at all affected by dementia. People who don't hear well progress in their dementia faster because they're not engaging in the same way and they're not understanding in the same way. So when somebody goes to a doctor's office, for instance, and there's a doctor and a nurse over here on a computer and they're asking you questions, how effective is that? Now you could hear me because I had a microphone, but if I'm over here saying, what's your name? Okay, just checking your address. You know, what's, um, you know, when's the last time you had a fever? Why are you here today? How personal does that feel? How comfortable does that feel? And that happens all the time. And um, so that hearing is really important because we need facial expression for people who don't hear well, but, um, and then let's talk about hearing aids in this just because it's important. For people who don't hear well, they're more likely to um, progress in their dementia quicker, but hearing is the one muscle in our body that does not regenerate itself. So we can be as weak as we can be, and we can be 100 years old, but we can still strengthen our, we can still strengthen our muscles with eight ounces of water, a little bit at a time, or you know, a water bottle or a little weight, a bag of rice, something. But our hearing never regenerates. So hearing aids can slow down the hearing loss. So for the people that refuse to get hearing aids, it just makes their journey much more difficult because they tune out. And as humans, we need engagement to keep our mind going. So it's, it's kind of a, I don't know, it's a, it's a rough circle to get somebody who doesn't want hearing aids to do it, but it's really important if you can um, convince them to be able to do that. So now understanding. So we're taking in words, we're taking in sentences, we're taking in stories, we're listening to conversations, but we get to the point where we can't process what they're saying. There's too many words, there's too much. We're only gonna hear the important words and by kind of mid-stage, mid to late stage dementia, we're gonna miss at least one out of every five words. So we need to reduce the amount of words we say when we're talking to somebody if we see that they're not processing well. And we can get off target with people. Now, again, this is compounded if we can't hear well, but focusing, what's the best way to converse with somebody? Anybody? Face to face, eye to eye, and you know what else? On the same level, because then we're equals. When we are standing above somebody and they're sitting in a chair, we are in a power position and the brain senses that. When we are equal to somebody 
or even lower than them, if we're sitting on the floor, their brain senses that they are in a power position and says, oh, this girl knows I'm smart. She's down there. I'm up here. And, and again, this is all autonomic nervous system. This is all unconscious. This is not the conscious part of the brain, but it's like the nonverbal stuff that I was talking about that the brain is still completely capable of. All right? So they can read our facial expressions. They can read the tone of our voice, the speed of our voice. If I said, I love you, how likely are you to believe me? But if I said, oh, dad, this is such a rough day. We're not doing so well today. But you know what? We're going to make it a great day. We're going to have fun. We're going to go out and get ice cream. He could have not understood a word I said. It could have been French. But my tone of voice said, I got you. And that's, that's, that's what happens. That's how they learn to read. And they learn how to cover. And couples learn how to cover for one another because they get the symbiotic relationship going. All right. So executive control center, emotions, behavior, judgment, reasoning. White matter, you've heard of white matter. That's um, people with... Um, Vascular dementia have white, uh, like more white matter than people. So um, that's, there's a great picture of white, white matter right up there. Um, the reasoning is one of the things that goes fastest, right? But judgment. We are all going to make mistakes until the day we die. We are all going to do things that are wrong. But judgment is when we're kind of assessing what is safe and what isn't safe, what is smart and what isn't smart. That's what gets kind of haywire. Now, I use these great colors in here on purpose because red, we're slowing down, we're stopping, okay? It's the white matter's going away. The connections are being lost. They're getting looser, all right? We've got big changes on what we're... Um, what we're sensing right now. Our speech, the automatic speech, this kind of stays the same, good and calm. Social chit chat. You see the neighbor, George, how are you? How are the grandkids? How's the golf game? Great, good to see you. Nice to see you, Flo, blah, blah, blah. They're gone. And somebody says, I thought he had dementia. He's like, well, I thought he did too, but he seemed fine to me. We have been doing social chit-chat our whole entire lives. So our body, muscle memory, just kicks into gear, and we can just do that, and we appear to be just fine. Again, the amygdala kicks in and says, I got you covered, buddy. I got you covered. Now, the right side of our brain is rhythm, and we remember rhythm. The part of the brain that processes music does not get affected by dementia. There's a really great movie called Alive Inside. It's on Netflix, and it's all about these social workers that gave iPods to people with dementia, and people who had been nonverbal for a really long time were grooved into the music and, in instances, singing and talking. So the other part of the side, the other side, pardon me, the other side of our brain, the right side, remembers the bad words, the expletives. That's why... You hear the, um, the little phrase, grandma talks like a sailor, because that part does not get affected by the dementia. So it comes out. And certainly we all lose our filter a little bit more as we get older. Well, that filter gets lost a little bit quicker as dementia progresses. So that's all preserved, that nice calm blue. Um, the big changes that are going fast, 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 formal speech, language, we can't pull those words out. So nouns are the first things that we will start to not use because there's so many of them and they're filed in so many ways, homonyms, synonyms kind of thing. Um, so we might be talking about it that whatchamacallit. And I do it when I'm stressed all the time because there's times where I've got a lot going on. I just won't be able to remember a word. And it freaks me out, but everybody does it. And I don't do it when I'm not stressed. Um, I, I notice that thing. I might call this an arm clock instead of a wristwatch. I might come up with different names. I had a person who, um, you know, the banana thing that you talk into, and you know, like the telephone, you 
yes, because, you know, it used to be shaped more like a banana back in the day, but we come up with different ways so that people can understand what we're saying. We can't come up with those words. Everybody thinks, oh my gosh, I lose my keys, I lose my keys, I lose my keys, I've got dementia. It's when we get to the car and we don't know what to do with the key. It's a completely different concept. All right, sensory changes. We become unaware of what's happening in our body. I spoke earlier about urinary tract infections. When we're younger, um, women are just more prone to them when we're younger. younger men yet, um, are more prone to them when they're older. But how we know we have a urinary tract infection when we're younger is there's a burning sensation when we urinate. We feel like we have to go to the bathroom all, time, all the time. Um, we might get a little backache because some of the white blood cells are going to our kidneys. It's very different. It, it hurts. It's not comfortable. But we lose that ability. We lose those sensations. So when you ask somebody, are you hungry? And they say no. And you're like, every time I ask if he's hungry, he says no. Well, we don't say, are you hungry? It's time for breakfast. It's time for lunch. Because they can't recognize the hunger. They can't recognize the thirst. We walk up with a glass of water, let them drink it, and we walk away. Um, because we're trying to make sure that somebody stays hydrated. But when they have the big gulp next to them all the time, they think they're drinking it even though they're not. All right? Four areas of our body stay um, very sensitive sensory aware. Our lips, our hands, our genitals, and our feet. So sometimes, and there's a stage of dementia in this program that's very different than the stages you'll see on the computer, but they liken the different stages of dementia to different kinds of jewels, each being precious in their own way. And so there's a stage, it's kind of third from the end, where people become very sensory. And they might do things in inappropriate places, and so you have to change it up um, and make sure that you give them privacy when they need privacy. But um, even, you know, I've, I've seen people with dementia at that stage looking at other people's breasts and just grabbing them because they look soft and squishy and comfortable. You know, they like it. Um, so we have to pay attention to the way we present ourselves, and that's why we, instead of like bending over to somebody, we always sit down in a chair next to them so that we're not putting the things that we don't want them to touch in front of them. Um, okay. So we hear a lot of stories about people that they don't want to take a bath. It's impossible to get mom in the shower. Mom isn't combing her hair. She's not putting on her face. You know, dad's worn the same pants for a whole week, and there's three different kinds of soup on them. But they don't see the need. They don't. They don't see why it's important. We had a family that um, the dad would want to get dressed every day and put on khaki pants and a red shirt. And this family had eight daughters. And those daughters went absolutely nuts because the neighbors were going to think he never changed his clothes. And, well, it turned out in doing a little history. And so looking at the history of our people really can make a difference in understanding some of the behaviors they do. The gentleman was a Coke delivery driver. So when he put on khaki pants and a red shirt every day, what was he thinking? He was going to work, absolutely. So we have to look at that. We can remember the muscle memory of doing particular things. So maybe when somebody is getting to a point, we talked about brushing their teeth earlier, all you have to do is brush your teeth next to them and they can go through the same motions that you do because we don't want to use words anymore. They're not processing in the same way, but we can mimic, we can mime, and they can do it right with us. That's the part we remember. All right. So I talked earlier about not finding the right words. Word salad, where you really see the words scrambled up, that's quite late in the game, or that's also when somebody's had a stroke. Um, <clears throat> you'll see a lot of um, discombobulation of words and um, adverbs and adjectives and verbs kind of in different places. Maybe the thought process is all there. They just haven't constructed the sentence in the right, in the right way. Um, going back to the music, now we can sing. Singing or humming 
Um, gentle music can bring calm or music of your life. So your music of your life is your music between 13 and 30. What was the stuff that you groove to then? That typically is the stuff that you will groove to now. You might like something a little bit more mellow if it was really raucous, but maybe not. Um, but singing with somebody, if you're trying to get a task done and it's very difficult, sometimes singing or humming, or oftentimes I should say, um, singing or humming can help them to get the task done because you can put the task to a rhythm and you can get their head in a really good space so that you can help even help them to get dressed or do things that might be a little bit more difficult um, because their brain is focused on the happiness of the singing. So this slide went awry in so many different ways. We need to focus on that relationship. And so how do we meet them where we are? And kind of always look to that when you're trying to accomplish a task, meet an expectation. What we want to do is we want to get rid of our agenda. Family members, again, when we're not full-time caregivers that we're committed in our heart to being a full-time caregiver, we're just doing what we need to do to get through the day, that's a very different kind of process. And we we have things that we need to get off of our list. We need to just reduce the size of our list probably by 75 or 80 percent and focus on what is necessary and then focus on what you'd like to have done. From a clinician's perspective, so let's look at somebody who's in a doctor's office or a social worker. You have very specific things that you need to get done. So prioritize what your things are and then look at who your person is and how do we connect with them from some of the things in their past. One of the things I use is a, um, I have a form and it just says, tell me about, tell me about Lucy. Where did Lucy grow up? What was her job? What does she like? What does she not like? What sets her off? What is something that just makes her happy no matter what? Um, what's her favorite music? What's her favorite food? But learning these things about the people that you're working with give you talking points. Connection points with somebody can be as simple as, oh my gosh, that's beautiful red hair. Or your shirt makes your eyes look so blue. When we're connecting to somebody and we're interested in them, oh, you like the Green Bay Packers. Tell me, you know, I'm a Minnesota fan and I know that we're not, you know, I know that we're rivals, but that, you know, your, your, play, your football player is the best player in the league. Something to compliment them, something to connect to them with. Then you get their attention, and it makes a difference. Families will often ask why when I talk to people do the, does the client respond, but when they talk to them, they don't. I always sit next to the client, and I look them in the eye, but when I have a question for them, I'll just touch, her, you know, touch their arm very, you know, just, just really gently before I as I'm looking at them, and once they look at me, I take my hand off, but now we're, I connected with them. I got a way to connect so that we could have that conversation and we could focus together. So little things like that can make a huge difference when you're trying to make a connection with somebody. So now close your eyes one more time. Now open them. Who sees old woman? Who sees young woman? More young women than old women. So I will tell you that anybody over the age of 60 and probably before, in our heads, we're way younger than the 60 or 70 or 80 or 90 that we are. We imagine ourselves, I'm still 35 in my head. My body betrays me, but my, my head is 35. But anybody who's, again, 70, 80, 90, body be rough, I'm still fun. They still like to travel. They still like to do things. So when they're answering questions, they're answering from their young self, not from their old self. When you ask something physical, it will be from their old self if the pain is real. But when you're asking some really generic questions, they're going to tell you their ideal because that's where they are in their head. So understanding that about the people that you're connecting with is hugely important. Um, so clinician's perspective, the eye contact, we talked, we touched base on that, the connection. Patients right now, 
ever, I mean, there's been that since the beginning of time, I feel, in my work with folks for the last 25 plus years. But they don't feel connected when they go to a physician. They just don't. But that eye contact makes all the difference. Is this lost? I just feel like, is it working? OK, I can't hear myself anymore. Anyways, so we talked a little bit about reading between the lines. Connecting also with the partner. Um, if you have somebody in the office, or you're dealing with somebody, and you don't feel that maybe they are always in the same state, or that there's something going on, whether it be with their emotional health, their physical health, their spiritual health, ask them, is there a reason to come to a doc? Oh, I'm sorry. Come to a doctor appointment with you? Could there be somebody that could be another set of eyes and another set of ears for you? Because that makes a big difference. Because then when they go home, they're going to be able to talk about it with somebody. They're going to be able to remember what, what they said. Um, I called my mother-in-law one day, and this was, I don't know, 10, 15 years ago. She was in perfect health, um, and, and she was crying. And I said, Paul, why are you crying? And she said, I need shoulder work. Something's wrong with my shoulder. And I said, OK, well, it's OK. What's wrong with your shoulder? I don't know. She said, the doctor told me. He said everything. I took notes. It made total sense at the time. But my notes don't even make sense to me right now, and I don't know. Because when we're sick and we're not feeling well, we can't remember it. It doesn't make sense because we're not processing. We're not thinking about the shoulder. We're thinking about how it is affecting our lives. And so we have to remember that when we're dealing with people, if there can be that other person in there. I always recommend for people to take somebody to the doctor with them to help be their advocate, especially in the world now. So think about that when you're coming to that perspective. How do you connect with them? Um, remember that processing time, chemo gives chemo brain, and it just scrambles you and you think so slowly. And some people experience it worse than others at different times through their processes of both chemo and radiation, but giving people just time to get it out and to think about what, how they're going to respond and what they're going to say, we're always trying to rush them because we're on a clock. So we just have to think of things a little bit differently. Again, cancer, folks experiencing cancer, as much as possible to have somebody go to the doctor with them, absolutely. Dementia, absolutely. Diabetes, absolutely. It's, it's a great thing. So if somebody believes that something is a particular way, join them. We're almost over. I think there's two more slides. Join them on their journey. You can't change where their head thinks they are, so meet them there. Validate what they're seeing. Validate what they're feeling. Validate how they um, are responding. Because if you match them, you feel awful. This is sad. This sucks. I'm sorry this is happening to you. I'm sorry. I'm sorry goes so long because the brain registers that empathy. Nobody wants anybody to feel sorry for them. We want somebody to understand how we feel. That's what's most important. That's what they get out. We want to hear their story. That's what we want to validate. That would be horrible. I can't imagine what that would be like. Let me see if I can help you. What would feel good to you? How can I help you? Specific things. But meet them where they are. If they are in Kansas, go to Kansas. If they are in the desert, go to the desert. So what do we learn today? Peop oh, so see that PLWD, people or person living with dementia. It's a new acronym that you might see out there. Um, so that's what it stands for, person living with dementia. We talked about changing the, um, changing the way people look at dementia, getting rid of the stigma. A lot of times people would always use that phrase, suffering with dementia. But how do we know that they're suffering? We just think they're suffering because they're not doing it the same way they always did, right? But if you ask people with dementia, over 85% of them say that they have a good quality of life because they are loved and they have people taking care of them. We just are saying, ah, they're not how they were, so it's got to be awful. So switching that up. 
How do we keep that relationship being the most important factor front and center? What can you do differently using some of the things that we talked about today, about language, about processing, about understanding how they feel, about looking at what they can do still versus what they can't do? Um, we talked about the brain changing and dying. We talked about processing, giving them the space, staying within a field of vision that is comfortable for them, not approaching them in a quick way, but staying back, going back. And, you know, COVID really did a number on this with touch, with caregiving, especially with professional caregivers, with doctor's offices. We were gloved, we were masked, we were robed. But that handshake from so long ago is universal for everybody. And if so you put out your hand and somebody doesn't take it, we know to stay in our personal space. They are giving us a nonverbal message. Don't get any closer. And once we start making that connection, I guarantee they'll let you in. You just have to connect well enough. People aren't aware of the changes happening to them. More than 50%. I believe it's more than 60% actually, but I just like to be safe because you read different things. But if they don't have awareness, they're not going to admit to it, so you got to work around it. Um, adapting to working with their capabilities, meeting them where they are, acknowledging that what they see and what they feel and what they hear is not only valid but real to them. And again, that change is always on us, and it's exhausting. And um, we have to be in a place where we can think on our feet, we have to be in a place where we can feel on our feet. We have to be in a place where we can act according to what's happening. And sometimes we have the capability to do that, and sometimes we don't. But you know what? When you're trying, you're giving it your best, that is absolutely all you can do. There comes a point in certain situations we, where we may not always be the best option. That's when we know that we have to change. When we see something that affects safety, that is our impetus for change. Even if it's just any old illness, whether it's old age, whether it's dementia, whether it's anything, change that's not safe, or safety is affected, we ha that's our impetus for change. Safety is at risk. So never give up hope because there is always something that comes through. And even in the darkest of days and the roughest of times, there is always a smile. There is always a piece of sunshine. There is always something that comes through where water hasn't been in a really long time because we love, because we care, because we try, because we put effort into it, because we understand what it would be like to feel that way. As you sit in your chair right now, look up. Just look up, and I know there's bright lights. But imagine there is some talking head above you just giving you directions, giving you directions, giving you directions. A lot of times that's how people perceive us when we're not at that connective space, when we're not looking them in the eye and feeling it in the heart. And that's the part that takes practice too, especially if it's hard and we're frustrated and we don't know exactly what to do. I put this in there. I didn't mean... I was going to bring flyers, but I do these aging conferences, and they're free to the community. So I just, if anybody wants one, you can email me, but I just thought I'd share that. It's October 13th, and it's in Sun Lakes, um, but for families, if you know some. Thank you today. Anybody can reach out to me. I'll take questions right now, but anybody who has something private that you want to ask or you don't want to ask it in front of a crowd, you can email me or call me next week because I'm not around for the rest of the week. But questions, anybody? Go ahead. Okay. Um, it, that's, um, that's a normal progression for, you know, that's just normal progression. It, it is a neuro, it is a neuro connection and that is very much end stage. Um, do you have hospice? 
Okay, good. Because a lot of people, a lot of people wait till the last three days or the last three weeks to get on hospice, and hospice can be such a godsend once you are eligible for it. But um, no, just you know, just that. So your your best your best ways to communicate, you know, soft touch, dim light, soft music, all the things that would make sort of logical sense um, on on how to do that. And I'm, I'm certain you probably still have different points where she connects with you. You know, favorite foods, soft things, um, soft things to touch. Velvet is a really lovely, um, is a lovely thing. Or sometimes something with buttons so that there's, you know, a little bit of texture. You can sew buttons, sewing buttons on a piece. Of, I keep thinking that's how I'm going to make my million is I'm going to sew buttons on velvet. But I know that's silly, but, um, but I'm, yeah, that's, you're, you're kind of in that right place. What, what causes the brain to shrink? It, 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 whether it's a combination, you know, because the chemicals and the fluids would be, would be volume as well, but it's dying. So most things, when they die, they begin to shrink. You start losing um, the cells. The cells, are, the cells are dying. So as the cells die, the physicality of it shrinks. So, okay, so can junk food, I didn't repeat that question before, and I, it was, I was joking because I, I always say that I do. So the question is, can junk food speed up the progression of dementia or just speed up ill health, right? Would it affect the brain? So, so from a nutrition standpoint, I just went to, I just went to a lecture on this. You hear it all the time. The things that are best for your body, dementia specific, it's across the board, everything that you have been heard. Good exercise because you need blood flow and oxygen to the brain, to the heart, throughout the body. Good diet, absolutely, because we're putting good, healthy, clean foods into our body. Diet, exercise, nutrition, hydration, and the thing that they just found out most recently that really is um, affecting, um, that, that they're seeing in people with more severe dementia, I guess, is bad gut health. That good gut health keeps you more lucid longer, is this, if, if, if that's the best way to say it. Good gut, gut, good gut health is, present, um, is good for overall body, but dementia specific, they've had a couple studies. And that was new to me. Um, I just learned that. Anybody else? Yep. Um, I, Okay, so this woman, to piggyback on this last question, her mom has late-stage Alzheimer's, and she just had a traumatic brain injury, and she asked her neurologist, was the um, traumatic brain injury necessarily going to put her to where her mom is, essentially? And he said, as long as you treat your body to treat your heart well, so the good diet, the, just what I spoke about, the good diet, the exercise, the hydration, um, keep your heart healthy and your brain will be healthy. Anybody? Yep. Yep. I don't have, I don't know the answer to that. The question was, um, can autism and bipolar disorder or other mental health disorders affect dementia? I have not been to a class nor read very many statistics on that, so I really can't speak to that, and I apologize. I will, I'm going to look it up now, though. Anybody else? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
Okay, so the question is, we stated that um, your physical health can affect the way uh, dementia affects your body, or the, um, but can the way you treat somebody affect the way, um, affect the dementia? And I guess, am I saying it right? You did it. So as humans, we need interaction to thrive, right? So not watching television, not reading a book, not listening to the radio, you know, everybody says do puzzles, do Sudoku. And yes, those are great things because you're exercising your brain. But when we're really good at something, it's more rote than not exercising your brain. Learning new things are the greatest thing that you can do for your brain. And two of the things that they say are the best things to do are technology and quilting. Quilting is all math, right? So my mother-in-law is an exquisite quilter, and she makes exquisite quilts. It's amazing what she does. But in that same vein where you're talking about how you treat somebody, yes, be, because even if somebody's in the house with you, but you're not having interaction with them, there's no brain activity going on, right? There's no synapses. We need, that, we need those electric lights. We need those bright orange colors and those bright red colors. So learning something new, interacting, um, the music piece is really good because it gets you going. But um, there's a new thing, um, another new wave that's part of this dementia awareness program, and they're called memory cafes, and where families go, it's a place, so it's not literally a coffee shop, but you go and you meet as care partners, and you have coffee and donuts with a whole bunch of other people, and then there's a an engagement class for the person living with dementia, and there's a support group uh, for, the, for the care partner. So they're both getting what they need, they're just in separate places, and the care partner is not having to worry about what do I do with my partner. But, so let's say there are people at nursing homes or people that are living isolated at home alone. And you've read, I'm certain everybody here has read stories about what isolation has done during COVID. Um, when we're not having those connections, the brain starts to shut down. So if, let's say somebody hasn't had a visitor in a month, or you're, you go to visit grandma in the nursing home and it's been a month other than her routine people. So it goes like this, you're talking to her and she's not even looking at you. And you've got all these fun things to share and you brought pictures, but it might take 10 minutes for her to even make eye contact with you. And it might take another 10 minutes before she even goes, uh-huh. And yet one more 10 minutes, oh, before like a word comes out of her mouth. But 25, 30 minutes in, you're having a conversation because it took that long for all those brain cells to get moving and working and clicking to be able to really connect. So sometimes you go back to those pictures even though she was shuffling through them because there was no acknowledgement, there was no recognition, there was no connection to what was happening. So yes, the way we interact or lack of interaction makes an enormous difference. And, and some people will have interest for it and some people don't. But, and then we have to it's always like we have to be a, de a detective, not a judge. We can't judge them for what they're not doing. We have to keep thinking about what do we do, how do we do it, how can we try, what can we do differently. Um, things like balloon, volleyball, it's really simple, but it does so many different things because it's eye-hand coordination. It's moving your hands up and down. It's paying attention to what's going on. It, you look at it and you think, oh, that's really dumb or that's really inane. But it's not because it's making all these different parts of your body connect. So I just use that as an example because it's something you'd think that wouldn't be a big deal, but it's a really big deal. Um, anything else in the back? So that's a really great question. So um, she posed core negative. Um, we talked about people remembering long ago memories. And if those core memories were negative, would that necessarily make a person aggressive? Does it mean they will be aggressive? No. 
Does it mean they can be? Yes, because they're reliving and it's kind of like PTSD. Um, so if those are the things that keep circling in their heads, yes, it can. I, I could write a book of stories with people that have had bad experiences in their life and they are reenacting those experiences. Now in those same ways, funky little things will also create. So yes, you might get some behaviors, you might get some aggression, um, sometimes even violence, and sometimes those things have to be managed with medications. But now even things like, it's very common for spouses to accuse spouses of cheating on them. You love somebody else, you're out with your girlfriend again, blah, 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 blah. In almost every case that I have been involved with, like in support groups or clients or different things, when I have said, are you, did, are you a second husband or a second wife? Or are you the first husband? Second marriages, the first marriage there was a cheater, and now they're reliving that over and over again. And so, and especially as people get um, closer to life, let me tell you one other story. This woman had her shoes lined up in the bedroom under, you know, under the window. And her husband was like, can we put away the shoes? No. Can we put away the shoes? No. How about today? Can we put away the shoes? No. And I had a caregiver come in and the husband was like, can you get the shoes in the closet? I don't know. So she said they were making up the bed and they did a little dusting and the caregiver brought out the vacuum and said, oh, I can't vacuum here. Can we, let's move these so that I can vacuum. And the wife said, no, we can't. She said, let's put them in the closet. And, um, and the woman said, I, I, I can't do that. And she said, well, why can't you do that? And she said, because if I put them in the closet, my sister will steal them. She always steals my shoes. Oh my gosh, that was ding. But the husband never asked why. Like he never thought to ask why. She said, well, what if we put cool names on the boxes? Like what if we put recipes on this box and we put wrapping paper on this box and we put bows on this box? And she was like, what a good idea. Now they had a project and they put shoes in boxes and they put them up on the shelves and the husband was happy and they had something that they did all afternoon long. But you know, it just kind of takes thinking out of the box a little bit to kind of do things in different ways. But as we get older, as we get older um, and we're nearing more end of life, our brain wants to tie up loose ends. So maybe there were injustices in our past that it's called, that there's, a, there's a whole, well, there's not many, but um, um, Naomi File, um, she was like the dementia queen that like really dug into this validation therapy and people reliving their rough spots and trying to put closure to the things that, that weren't closed within them. And that's when some of these behaviors um, that you're talking about are uncomfortable things. War is horrible for a lot of these folks when they go back to, you know, whatever, whether it was Vietnam or Korea. There's, we've got like two people from World War II still in our care. But um, yes, that can absolutely make a difference. But all little things can too. Even somebody stealing from you or, you know, siblings doing things like that or best friends, you know, taking your husband, stuff like that, huge impact. Other things? Yep. Okay, so the question is, um, thanks for coming, you guys. Um, the question was um, hoarding and paranoia. Like, so hoarding usually, um, I've, I've only taken like two seminars on it, but hoarding usually there's been some sort of trauma. Um, and, and even depression people, that trauma um, can make people not want to throw things away. Hoarding can be as serious as just, you won't throw away any magazines. My husband will say, you keep hoarding magazines. He doesn't really, but I'm just saying, I, I like them. Um, but um, things, but serious hoarding can be like used band-aids all over the bathroom wall. So it can, it can be really significant. But typically there's been some kind of an emotional 
adjustment. But paranoia, again, locking the doors, locking the window, somebody's out there, somebody's going to get me. Somewhere in that psyche, there has been something that has happened where that fear has reigned, and that usually comes out. From all the studies that I've read, there's always like some, you know, some little kernel, some little nugget that isn't resolved that is bringing that, um, you know, to display. Yep. I can't, oh, so the question was, how does schizophrenia, how is that different from dementia? And, um, maybe Lee, wherever she is, could speak to that. I can't, I can't speak to, um, I can't speak to mental illness. I have not studied it. So I, I don't know, and I apologize for that. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, somebody else had some. Yep, go ahead. So the question is if somebody's having a bad core memory. Um, what is the best way to distract them? So, um, so let's be specific. Be, um, so, are they are they just fretful? Are they doing something physical? Um, are they just um, you know you, how you would just kind of moan and say oh me or oh my or you know they're kind of just ruminating over it? Give me something to. Okay, so so a spouse um, a spouse accusing uh, um, somebody of cheating on them. So a, a couple diff a couple different things. We don't always know where where their head is in terms of what level of dementia that we are, but we have to look. How do we always make them feel special? How do we? And I love you. I would never want to hurt you. I'm so sorry you feel that way. Like go to the core emotion. They're feeling fragile. They're feeling hurt. They're feeling dishonest. And to speak to the core emotion of that. I am sorry you think that. I would never do that. I'm sorry you feel that way. I love you. Physical touch. A lot of people with dementia don't get the same level of physical touch. We talked about earlier about going in and touching them in ways to take messes off their faces or, you know, thinking you need to help them in some way, but we don't get we don't get good, warm, friendly touch. Holding hands, giving a hug, sitting together, you know, putting your arm around somebody, but then little things like bringing a flower in when you go outside or I brought your favorite drink, or um, you know, even even bringing when you go out. Hey, I saw this picture. I thought you would love it. Or I brought you a little kiss, and it's a, you know, it's a Hershey kiss. Little things that reinforce the the feelings that they're doing because those are visual things. Um, we we take it in a little bit differently. Yes, we want to use that word, but we also want to use the tone of voice that they know that we are being sincere in what we're saying. Because if we say, I've told you, I don't, I'm not seeing anybody. What is that? You know, you're really frustrated because we've told you 300 times, I am not seeing anybody but you. I only love you. Eh, 
You know, we don't hear it, but if we connect in that way that's warm and, and we show things that are physical and we do things um, that are little acts of kindness, little acts of kindness go a long, long way. And again, if, um, if they have music that particularly soothes them, the music can be things like holding hands, going for a walk together, making it a date, let's get dressed up. Like little things like that to bring back the warm memories from early courting days. Um, because if, if they had routines at that point, things like that will also come back. So I'll just bring up one last thing. Um, if, so a wife said, or a husband said to a wife, where is my wife? She's like, I'm right here. And she's like, you're not my wife. You are an old lady. I am not married to an old lady. Ah, where's my wife? And it, he got, you know, it was, it was a frustrated thing, and he got kind of anxious. And he was like, where is she? And now she's in tears because I'm your wife. It's been 60 years. And we've got that tone of voice, and it's a whole different thing. And she, she was just so frustrated but literally two hours later, they kind of went there. You know, she said, I'm just getting out of your hair. I'll go look for your damn wife, you know. Mm. So two hours later, he comes up to her with a picture of their wedding. And he gives it to her and says, that is my wife. So I talked about earlier how we believe that we are younger in our heads. He saw himself as the 20-year-old who married her. And that's who he was looking for. So... All of a sudden now she's bawling, not because she was sad, she was bawling because she felt like she was really mean and she treated him really unfairly because, again, it was the emotion. When we have those behaviors or those awkward behaviors, it's usually an unmet need of some sort. So connecting to the emotion that's behind that behavior, that situation, that's your best bet in connecting with somebody. You ever had a question? So the question is, what if they look at themselves in the mirror, like wouldn't he see his age if he thought he was young? It's not, I, I have a couple different, um, I have a couple different um, presentations where I have this old, there's like one, you can look it up on the internet. It's the old man looking in the mirror. And the man looking back at him is like, you know, he's young and he's beautiful. Like he sees the guy that he was when he was 35 when he looks in the mirror. So that's, you know, that's that reality piece. So that's not something that's going to ground you because the picture is in your mind's eye and not your eye. You know, not your visual piece. Anyways. Thank you guys so much for being here. Um, I hope this was helpful. Okay, good. <laughs> um, I will, if anybody has individual questions that you want to speak to me of, please feel free to come up or my contact information here, and you can always call um, or email. I will be around next week. And if anybody is interested in learning about an aging conference for family members or whatever, let me know, and I can shoot you a flyer. So on behalf of Cybeta and the Psychological Sciences Department, I would like to thank all of you for coming. Um, if you would please give your surveys to the front desk, the front table before you leave, we'd greatly appreciate it. And let, thank you so much for coming tonight. It's You're welcome. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. Can we get one more round of applause? For <laughs> thank you. This is for you. Oh, thank you so much. You. Our next evening lecture is October 6th, and it will be about postpartum illness, mental mm -hmm. illness, with Michelle Lacey of Women's Health Initiative of Arizona. So we hope to see you guys next time as well. <laughs>